He's won victory over death. I will win. He's paid for my sin. He's still passing by. Over death, I will win. He's paid for my sin. He's still passing by. Still passing. Sinner uncleansed by the Savior's sweet blood He knows not the grace that flows from above His soul was tossed upon a sea of doubt and despair Oh, but this child does not have to endure A life filled with doubt and so insecure Cause His promise is true, He's waiting for you He's still passing by Still passing by that sinner unsaved, he's still blessing souls that call on his name from heaven's high throne. His sovereign majesty still reigns. His grace is still full and so free for the lost soul with faith. He's won victory over death. I will win. He's paid for my sin. He's still passing by. Woman went down to draw from the well Her soul was so thirsty and headed for hell But she met the one whose will of life shall never run dry And he spoke the words that touched a cold heart A woman once lost now found a new start She ran to her friend saying I'm born again And he's still passing by Still passing by that sinner unsaved, he's still blessing souls that call on his name from heaven's high throne. His sovereign majesty still reigns. His grace is still full and so free for the lost soul with faith. He's won victory over death. I will win. He's paid for my sin. He's still passing by. Over death I will win He's paid for my sin He's still passing by Still passing Sinner uncleansed by the Savior's sweet blood He knows not the grace that flows from above His soul was tossed upon a sea of doubt and despair Oh, but this child does not have to endure A life filled with doubt and so insecure Cause His promise is true, He's waiting for you He's still passing by Still passing by that sinner unsaved, he's still blessing souls that call on his name from heaven's high throne. His sovereign majesty still reigns. His grace is still full and so free for the lost soul with faith. He's won victory over death. I will win. He's paid for my sin. He's still passing by. Woman went down to draw from the well Her soul was so thirsty and headed for hell But she met the one whose will of life shall never run dry And he spoke the words that touched a cold heart A woman once lost now found a new start She ran to her friend saying I'm born again And he's still passing by Still passing by that sinner unsaved, he's still blessing souls that call on his name from heaven's high throne. His sovereign majesty still reigns. His grace is still full and so free for the lost soul with faith. He's won victory over death. I will win. He's paid for my sin. 
He's still passing by Over that Bible wind He's paid for my sin He's still passing by Still passing Sinner uncleansed by the Savior's sweet blood He knows not the grace that flows from above His soul was tossed upon a sea of doubt and despair Oh, but this child does not have to endure A life filled with doubt and so insecure Cause his promise is true, he's waiting for you He's still passing by Still passing by that sinner unsaved, he's still blessing souls that call on his name from heaven's high throne. His sovereign majesty still reigns. His grace is still full and so free for the lost soul with faith. He's won victory over death. I will win. He's paid for my sin. He's still passing by. Woman went down to draw from the well Her soul was so thirsty and headed for hell But she met the one whose will of life shall never run dry And he spoke the words that touched a cold heart A woman once lost now found a new start She ran to her friend saying I'm born again And he still passed by Still passing by that sinner unsaved, still blessing souls that call on his name from heaven's high throne. His sovereign majesty still reigns. His grace is still full and so free for the lost soul with faith. He's won victory over death. I will win. He's paid for my sin. He's still passing by. Over death I will win He's paid for my sin He's still passing by Still passing Sinner uncleansed by the Savior's sweet blood He knows not the grace that flows from above His soul was tossed upon a sea of doubt and despair Oh, but this child does not have to endure A life filled with doubt and so insecure Cause his promise is true, he's waiting for you He's still passing by Still passing by that sinner unsaved, he's still blessing souls that call on his name from heaven's high throne. His sovereign majesty still reigns. His grace is still full and so free for the lost soul with faith. He's won victory over death. I will win. He's paid for my sin. He's still passing by. Woman went down to draw from the well Her soul was so thirsty and headed for hell But she met the one whose will of life shall never run dry And he spoke the words that touched a cold heart A woman once lost now found a new start She ran to her friend saying I'm born again And he's still passing by Still passing by that sinner unsaved, he's still blessing souls that call on his name from heaven's high throne. His sovereign majesty still reigns. His grace is still full and so free for the lost soul with faith. He 
He's won victory over death I will win He's paid for my sin He's still passing by Over death I will win He's paid for my sin He's still passing by Still passing Sinner uncleansed by the Savior's sweet blood He knows not the grace that flows from above His soul was tossed upon a sea of doubt and despair Oh, but this child does not have to endure A life filled with doubt and so insecure Cause His promise is true, He's waiting for you He's still passing by Still passing by that sinner unsaved, he's still blessing souls that call on his name from heaven's high throne. His sovereign majesty still reigns. His grace is still full and so free for the lost soul with faith. He's won victory over death. I will win. He's paid for my sin. He's still passing by. Woman went down to draw from the well Her soul was so thirsty and headed for hell But she met the one whose will of life shall never run dry And he spoke the words that touched a cold heart A woman once lost now found a new start She ran to her
All right, good to be in church. Good to think about that third verse on that song. It says, His grace has brought me safe this far, but it's not just that. It's going to take me home. Amen? Amen. Isn't that good? Amen. It's good to be saved. It's not good to be in church. It's Wednesday night prayer meeting time. Uh, we had our four-year-old, soon-to-be five-year-old at the house this afternoon, and Tracy was cooking her little supper for her. She gave her a roll, and she said, Do you want some butter on the top? Or in the middle. And Vicky said, both. <laughs> I said, boy, that's a good answer, amen? It's a good answer. It is Wednesday night prayer meeting time. We'll open up the floor for a prayer request tonight. I'd like to make, uh, make known. Miss Tammy. Tammy's thankful for the Lord's goodness, uh, being with her through all that she's going through, amen, and uh, continue to pray for her children's salvation, the co-worker's sister, physical need, and then the brother's physical need as well. Yes, sir. Derek, right? Okay. Brother Derek asked us to remember his father-in-law and uh, that need there. That's about all I got. This thing kicked on down here and I, all my hearing left me as soon as that happened. Amen. Do remember his father-in-law in prayer. Brother Danny. Danny's family, especially Travis, and uh, thankful for answered prayer tonight, amen. And uh, continue to remember uh, Brother Lloyd Jones down in North Carolina. That need there, amen. Brother Roy. Continue, brother. Remember, brother Roy, sister Mary. Can you remember, brother Roy, especially in his physical need there, man? Brother Harold. Yeah. Remember those that can't be with us tonight, amen. Remember those traveling. Remember those who are home, uh, unable for illness and hospitals and think of the Kriglers and the Stalls and many, many tonight that would love to trade places with any of us. Amen. God's been good to us. Do remember them in prayer. Any unspoken requests we'll take with the uplifted hand tonight. All right, let's pray together. Uh, God, we are grateful for your blessings, God. We, uh, once again, Father, gather here in this place and stand in all of your goodness toward us, Father. I just ask you, Lord, to, to meet with us now in a special way. Father, speak to our hearts. and uh, Father, I pray that you to open our minds. and uh, Father, help us, Lord, to, to seek, uh, God, that which you'd have us to, to gain knowledge of tonight. and uh, Lord, to, to wrap it up within ourselves. and uh, Father, help us to, to learn more about you and to know more about you. Uh, to walk closer to you, uh, to know you better. Father, I pray that uh, 
Lord, I, these requests, God, never made mention of tonight. Father, you know, uh, Father, the needs and the burdens, uh, Father, on each heart tonight. Father, even behind each uplifted hand tonight, Father, you know uh, the burdens that are there and the needs that are there. Lord, uh, I pray that you'd meet those needs, Father, in the manner that you'd see fit. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you'd help us, Father, to, to, to increase our faith, Father, in you and uh, God, your abilities, and uh, God, to help us to understand, Father, that uh, you're in control, Father, and that, uh, Father, help us to leave our, our cares with you. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you'd be with uh, the, all those who are sick tonight, God, many, uh, Lord, that need a healing touch, and uh, Father, that need comfort, and uh, God, I pray that you'd be with them, and uh, Father, many facing decisions, and Lord, I pray that you'd help them in that situation. Uh, God, I pray for many tonight, Lord, that we know that are lost, God, that need you. Uh, God, I pray that you touch uh, their hearts. and uh, Father, prick it uh, through the Holy Spirit, Father, even now. Father, they would uh, know of their need for salvation. And, Lord, I pray that they'd come to know you. Help us, Father, to, to do our part, uh, God, and help us to, to be a light before them. And, uh, God, I pray that you'd help us to be a witness, uh, God, even in how we live. And, Father, uh, God, I pray that uh, you would uh, be with us now, Father, as we look at your word once again, Father. And, I uh, pray that you bless it, uh, all the things that are said and done tonight. We love you tonight. Uh, God, we just thank you for being good to us, Father. And uh, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, God, that we have to be here to join together once again. Thank you for these that have came, Father. I pray that uh, you bless them. Father, bless those in the other buildings tonight working. And uh, we'll thank you and give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Get down here out of the way. <clears throat> hey, good to see you in church tonight. There's several folks that had indicated they were going to study this lessons with us. They're not able to be here tonight, so we pray for them as they watch the live streaming. You know what a, a type is? What is a type? A type of something. something that is used to help you understand something else. We use the word a shadow. Bible, the Bible uses the word types. And scripturally, the uh, Bible is filled with types. Uh, they are to help us understand the Lord Jesus Christ. Probably the most prominent type in the Bible would be what? What's the one used the most in the Bible? We go, we'll go back to Genesis and go all the way through the Bible and you'll find one thing in particular <clears throat> and when it's spoken of, it makes you think of Christ. What is it? It's the Lamb. Uh, matter of fact, uh, if you... Look through the Bible, you'll find that the lamb, the animal, the lamb, is representative of Christ. We know this from several passages. In particular, the book of Exodus, when God told Moses to institute the Passover, uh, the blood of the lamb and the death of the lamb, uh, the consuming of the lamb, all represented the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, John, uh, the beloved, uh, he mentioned when Christ came to be baptized of him in Jordan River, uh, John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Which again points us to the fact that the Lamb is a type of, it's not Christ, uh, not that physical Lamb, but Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's his blood, and that's why the blood of the Lamb uh, in 
the book of Exodus and on down through the Bible, the blood of the physical lamb of the Old Testament always represented the coming, the death, the shedding of Christ's blood for the sin of men. Now, there's a lot of types in the Bible, and, and again, we're not going to study all of them because we don't have that amount of time. But uh, we're going to spend a little while on studying the Old Testament tabernacle. Tabernacle is the place where God promised to meet with his people. It later, the tabernacle lasted about 500 years, as a matter of fact, from the time it was constructed in Moses' day until uh, it uh, was done away with. Solomon built a physical temple that could not be moved. Matter of fact, if you, if you really think about it, the tabernacle was the first portable building uh, that we have any record of. Uh, the tabernacle was set up here. God said, I'm going to lead you over here. They took it down, set it back up over there. Uh, there's no record in the 500 years of the existence of the tabernacle that ever needed to repair. Well, that'd be good today, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> said around here there's more repairs every week than <laughs> needs to be. But here, here's a building constructed by God's workmen under the authority of Moses, lasted 500 years, never needed repair. That's something within itself. But anyway, we're going we're to look at the tabernacle and how it typifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there are several places that I've marked out in the Bible. Probably won't get to them tonight all the way from Genesis to Revelation. All, all of the 66 books speak of Christ. And some of them in the way uh, from the very beginning sacrifice that was offered by God himself in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve's sin, uh, up until a yearly sacrifice that was offered at Passover in the tabernacle under the authority of Moses, as God instructed him to do, to an individual sacrifice that the people brought to the priests to be sacrificed. And these could be anything from a bullock, uh, a lamb, a goat. Uh, they could be uh, a turtle dove, depending upon, by the way, God never asks anybody for anything they can't afford. Uh, don't want to get on that tonight. But uh, uh, those who could afford it, uh, God required of them a more expensive sacrifice for the very poor. God didn't say just because you're poor, uh, you don't owe me a sacrifice. He said, I will accept even the turtle dove, just the little pigeon-like animal. He said anybody can give God what they can give God. We'll get to that eventually, probably not in our lesson tonight. We're looking at the tabernacle. I, I hope that you'll take a, a little time to, when you walk by that table back there. The uh, young people several years ago <clears throat> got together and constructed uh, this tabernacle that's back there. Uh, it's uh, something they learned, and I think you'd learn something just by looking at it. hope you'll learn something from here. Somewhere I had a thing that works this thing. I'm not sure I know how. Uh, most of the time, I don't. See what I mean? That's the wrong button. Okay. That wouldn't work. Uh, <clears throat> Most of these images, uh, I have a, I did a study on the tabernacle with an overhead projector, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 years ago, been a long time. Uh, most of my <coughs> equipment that I used back then won't work on this, so uh, we got some new stuff, hopefully that will help you, but everything, uh, of, in the tabernacle, of the tabernacle, everything involved inside of it, how it works, how it's put together, everything there that you look at is a shadow or a type of Jesus Christ in his redemption uh, plan as well as in his coming as deity or God in the flesh. And when you look at the, 
complete tabernacle. The, the outside, if you notice, these columns, between those columns are white linen. And we'll not dis discuss what they represent, but everything about it represents something about Christ. These, uh, the front here, down on this end where the, you know I'm colorblind, so if I say something's one color and it's something else, just look over me, all right? Purple. Uh, the gates down here are a different color. This is where that folks came in to the general part of the tabernacle. It's not really the tabernacle that's there. The part back here in the upper right that's covered, uh, that is uh, the holy place and the most holy place. Actually, only the priests were allowed inside that section. And the back section of that, it's a, it's a building that is 15 foot wide, 45 foot long. Uh, the, the Holy of Holies, which is in the back part of that, we'll get to that later, is a section where that the Ark of the Covenant, where the high priest goes once a year to make a sacrifice and offering for the sins of the nation. It's 15 by 15 by 15. And of course, that, like I said, that's part of the, the other part's 30 by 15, which the whole thing's 45 by 15. Uh, you probably get a better picture of it maybe by looking at the uh, one on the table back there. Uh, this part is a breakdown of the inward part of the tabernacle. Uh, Y'all may feel like I'm losing you. I don't mean to. I do not want to uh, go to a place to where you don't understand what I'm saying because everything about the tabernacle speaks of Christ or his redemption, everything. From the, from the white walls to the gate to the holy place to the holy of holies, everything that's laid out in the courtyard uh, has something to do with Christ and redemption. And it would be impossible for a person who is a Jew that understands the Old Testament uh, not to understand that this is Christ were it not for the fact that it seems as though their eyes have been closed and God hasn't revealed it to them. Uh, it has to do with everything about Christ. Their worship, their worship, uh, the manner it was laid out, everything speaks to Christ. Now I can't I can't read all those things up there, and you can't either, but I've got one here if I get it close enough to my eyes. <laughs> I can. I can see it. But if you look in the very back of the tabernacle, the, the, it's kind of laid out to where you can see inside. That very back part is 15 by 15 by 15, and it is the place called the Holy of Holies the place where the only furniture in that is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, since we're there, I teach a little different, and I like to ask questions. So if we're looking at the Ark of the Covenant, it has some things within it. The Ark of the Covenant, about like this table, all right? It's a K of wood, which is a wood that just will not rot, overlaid with pure gold. Uh, it has a top to it. We'll talk about that all together later. But inside this ark are some things, again, that's very important. Anybody remember what they are? Number one was what? Now you got to speak up because it's not your fault, it's my fault here. Amen. Okay? Ten Commandments, the tables of stone, all right? By the way, why were they put there? Where did they come from? Well, now you got, you got to remember the Ten Commandments on stone 
that Moses first got, God carved them. But after Moses broke them, God made Moses carve out the next set. And so people would not forget God's commandments. They were placed in the Ark of the Covenant. There was uh, something else in there. What was it? I know y'all got the right answer. I just can't hear you well. Aaron's rod that budded. Aaron, Aaron's rod that budded. By, by the way, what, what, it, what, what significance is that? I mean, what, what purpose is putting Aaron's rod in there? All right. This is how God told the people that Aaron and his descendants are to be the priests. There was a little rebellion. We'll not go into all that. And, and the people always mess up when they rebel against God. And so they decided, Moses told the people, each leader of each tribe was to bring a dead stick we'll call it that and lay it before the Lord and God would tell them which tribe was to be the priest and how he told them was is that Aaron's rod came alive it, but it brought forth it was alive and that's how come Aaron and his sons became the priest for the nation of Israel but there was, there was something else in there A pot full of manna. Y'all know what manna is, right? It was that food that the people of Israel got tired of. People are never satisfied. They could have all starved to death in the wilderness. But God fed them every day. By the way, uh, again, we don't have time to go into this aspect of the representation of Christ. Christ is the keeper of the law. Christ is the great high priest, referring to the rod that budded. And also Christ is that bread which came down from heaven that provides for his people. So these three things, I have, uh, I have a friend who does nothing but teach on the tabernacle. Some of y'all might remember, he came here 30 or so years ago, had a big... Uh, a big setup back here in the back, as before we had all this building in, here's all the way in the back. Had a big setup with the, basically, the, uh, something that looked like the ark and what was in the ark and uh, kind of a, a life-size uh, holy of holy place that was set up. Anyway, he says there's something else in there. The only thing I've found is those three things. I do know those three things were there because God says it was. Says they were, if I can get my is and were together. But uh, there's a, if you can see close enough, the main entrance into the holy place is here in front. You go through there and then there's another curtain that separates the holy place from the holy of holies. That means within the holy of holies, the only thing there is the Ark of the Covenant, what's in it. And it's separated from where the other priests come to serve by another curtain. Remember what happened when Christ died on the cross? The Bible says that God ripped that curtain from the top to the bottom. I've read a lot of different opinions and so-called uh, Jewish scholars, uh, they say that that curtain, that particular curtain, uh, when it was made, we'll discuss a little bit about it sometime later on, but when it was made, that they attached six oxen, three on this side and three on this side, and hooked them to it to stretch it apart to see if there was any particle of light that could go through it before. Which means, by the way, nobody, no man ripped it apart. Only God could do it. And by the way, it started at 15 foot up, so nobody's going to reach it anyway. Questions? Or? Hey, you know, uh, 
There it is eventually. That's maybe a little better breakdown of the uh, holy place and holy of holies. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details. Matter of fact, I know you cannot see them, all these things written around here. But everything there, these posts, all the posts on the outer part of the enclosure, all of those posts are bronze posts set in silver sockets. Like I said, it was the first portable building that we have any record of ever being built. Actually, it was like <clears throat> there was silver that was set in the ground, the post set in them, fit in them perfectly so that this outside wall of white linen could be stretched like it's stretched. By the way, what in the Bible, everything has a meaning. So while we're right there, let's just ask one simple question. What does silver mean in the Bible? Redemption. Uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, you'll find that the redemptive price, redeeming price, that when the people came before God, they bought the price of redemption, which was a, I forget the name of the, of the coin, but it was a silver coin. And y'all speak up. I, I like people to talk. I don't know that I know your answers, but uh, I think maybe there's a little bit of breakdown on. Hmm? Let's go that way, that way. There it is. <laughs> a little better breakdown on the inward part. When you came into the Tabernacle. Again, only the priests were allowed in here. This outer court that we looked at a while ago where the white coverings were, this is where the people came. This is where they brought their offerings. This is where they gave the offering to the priests. This is where they stood at the altar uh, for their offerings to be sacrificed. In this part, which is called the tabernacle, only the priests could come. Back in the back part, only the high priest could go, and he could only go once a year. Now, in the holy place out here, if you look, there's some what we call furniture there. Anybody remember what was there? I heard something, but I didn't get it. Over, over on the far side, as you look at the breakaway, over on the far side is a little table. And that table had something on it. Does anybody remember what that was? It was his bread, all right? It was brought there for the priest uh, to represent the bread of life, which by the way was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, there were 12 rolls of bread, one for each of the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, the Jews did something different than we do. People come to church and like the padded pews, right? Yeah, I'd say, yeah, I like padded pews. I, you know, when I was growing up, everything was slat benches. <coughs> and you'd get hurt on them. Within the tabernacle itself, there was only one seat. And the whole encounter, when we were looking at the, where the white border from the outside, from the time you come through the front gate, there's only one seat in the whole place. Anybody know what that was? 
where it was. Cole speaking up too much tonight. Now you, the only seat in the town, and the whole place was the seat that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant of God. Nobody was allowed to sit on it. It was God's throne. And when we look at it, you'll see that it is actually made in that manner. And there was a reason for that too. Uh, this gives you pretty much the measurements of the whole camp. If you notice, this whole thing is set up in the midst of the people of Israel. That means that there's 12 tribes. Everybody remember that part, 12 tribes. Every tribe had a place. In other words, uh, we didn't have one tribe and this other tribe getting together and camping together. Matter of fact, every tribe had their pl place. If you look at if you look at the front of the camp, on the left side, going up and down, uh, the tribe of Ishkar, the tribe of Judah, and the tribe of Zebulun. We're talking about a million or more people. We're not, talk, we're not talking about two or three hundred. We're talking about a million or more people. They are an army that God put together. Each tribe had a place, each tribe had a position, each tribe had a duty, each tribe had, had a responsibility. And to be honest with you, like I said, the tribe of Ephraim and, uh, and the tribe of uh, Judah, uh, they didn't uh, have their closest friends in a tent by their side. They actually camped in groups of tribes and they camped in a certain place around the tabernacle and they each one had a job to do in reference. To, can, you, can you imagine, well, maybe we'll get there, not tonight, but can you imagine assembling and disassembling and assembling again this tabernacle in just a short time? I mean, I, hundred men's not going to do it. And by the way, a hundred men that wants to do somebody else's job will not get it done. Matter of fact, each tribe had a responsibility. Each tribe had a job. And they had a way even when in their camp when they, when they stayed a month. By the way, they stayed till God said move and when God said move, they all got up and moved the way God told them to. Uh, can you imagine the enemy? Let's say uh, the Canaanites, or whatever, one of the, one of the other nations that's powerful and got a great army. Can you imagine how they felt when they saw a million Jews marching together toward where they were at? Uh, the idea of what's going on in, in Russia and Ukraine right now has no comparison. Matter of fact, Bible indicates that some of these nations became very fearful because somebody told them, those folks over yonder, they're coming. And anyway, questions? Y'all got it all down? I, I'll tell you what it'll do. Let, listen real close. I'll tell you what it'll do. If you'll study this study with me when we get through, next time you hear a preacher preaching about some of these things, you'll understand what they're saying a whole lot better than you ever have before. It's not complicated. All right. Well, we're back now to where we started from. So I guess it's time we... We did it. Let's back up a little bit. This will back up. Yeah, back up. One more time. One more time. We talked about 
inside the holy place, the holy of holies. We talked about on that side, if you look real close, you'll see the table of bread. Right straight across from the table of bread on the other side of the tabernacle is something else. Anybody remember what that was? The lampstand, all right. Candelabra, I I'm not really sure how you would do it. It's a seven branch, seven branch lampstand on, on the top and it's made, it's a very ornate piece. It's made of solid gold and it has at the top of it these lights kind of like the old coal oil lamp that would be just small that had the oil in it and the wick in it stay lit. Matter of fact, there was one fellow who had one job. That was to keep the lamps burning. We, we talked about two, two places in this holy place. One of them's the bread. By the way, I said everything in here represents Christ. Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter number six, I am the bread of life. I'm not that manna that came down from heaven. He said, I am the bread of life. Like the manna God gave, he came. But then on the other side of the wall, there's the lampstand. I think Jesus said something about that too, didn't he? He said, I'm the light of the world. Uh, and uh, he's represented both by the bread and by the light. Now there's something else in there. Anybody remember what else is in there? Huh? No altar in here. The altar's, the altar's out here. Actually, the altar's way out front. Inside, inside there, it's called the laver of cleansing. It's a, uh, a brazen uh, basin-like that has water in it. And the priest that served in there had to wash themselves when they went in. Had to be clean. Boy, that'd tear up a lot of Baptist churches, wouldn't it? But anyway, <laughs> I'm not talking about just physical cleanliness, so don't, don't go there. All right? There was, there was the laver of cleansing right before, and the high priest in particular. There was one, you can't see it in this picture, Maybe you can if you get close enough. Maybe you can see it without being that close. But right before the second curtain, there's a cleansing laver too. And this basically is the high priest cannot enter into the Holy of Holies until he stops to be clean again. Let's see the showbread, the uh, candle, the uh, bowl of cleansing, something else, what was it? Anybody remember? Now I forgot too. The altar of incense. Oh, the altar of incense, that's right. Uh, by the way, it's a, it's kind of like these folks like to burn these little things that make a lot of sweet smells, I never did. Anyway, it's, it's an altar there that incense is burning into the Lord. And it's, it represents the prayers of the people who are praying. And by the way, the Bible does say that our prayers go up before the Lord. And a sweet smell is what the Bible calls it unto the Lord. Uh, when, you, when you get out into the outside section, especially when you go through the gate. First thing that you meet when you go into the outside gate is what? It's the brazen altar. Uh, it's where that people bring their offerings and the priest slays the offering. Uh, there's a 
hundred things that has to do with that. Matter of fact, some offerings, the whole offering, slain, the blood shed, and the animal itself put on the altar to be burned. Some of the offerings, by the way, there are six particular offerings, and we can't deal with them tonight, but some of the offerings are brought. A portion of the offering is kept by the priest. A portion of the offering is burnt on the altar. But the altar is there as a place of sacrifice. And <clears throat> let's go a little bit. I know I'm running out of time, but let's, let's look at just something for just a second. We talk about the altar. A lot of times in preaching, we invite folks to come to the altar. Why? What does the altar represent? I'm not trying, listen, I'm not trying to trick you all. I know some of you think if I say anything, preacher's going to say I'm wrong. I, that's not what it's about. What it's about is to convince you that to, you need to think because when you come up with your thoughts, you'll remember it a whole lot better if I just stand up here and talk to you about it. But the altar is a place of sacrifice. It's with it, you cannot get past the brazen altar and get anywhere else inside the gates. First thing you come to is the altar of sacrifice. Can I illustrate that a little different right now? You'll never get close to God by going to the altar, talking about how good you are and what a wonderful person you are and what you deserve. When we go to the altar, it's a place to sacrifice. Most folks think the church anymore is a place to go to get things. But I won't tell you, you'll never get anything from God until you learn to give to God. He wants your life. He wants your heart. He wants your mind. He wants you. And that's what the altar's for. I mean, it's, it's to come and say, Lord, I'm nothing, and you have everything, and I want to be a part of your family. I mean, sacrifice. He didn't say bring a lamb or bring a bullock or even bring a turtle dove. He says come and bring yourself. Bring your life. Bring your heart. We talk about I, I don't even want to get into what a heart is. We, we use that term so loosely. Uh, God doesn't ever get to your heart till it gets past your mind. What do you mean, preacher? You can't give him your heart if you don't understand who you're giving it to. And you can't give him your heart until you know who he is. Anyway, uh, the first thing that a person comes to when they go to the tabernacle is the altar of sacrifice. Wow. That'd be nice for a Baptist church, wouldn't it? If everybody who came to the house of God came with the intention of offering up to him our life as a sacrifice. You never get you'll never get past, you'll never get past somebody go, oh preacher, I just want to be a happy Christian. You can't be a happy Christian until you've offered to him your very best. And that's everything. I'm glad you came tonight. Maybe some of the other folks that said they wanted to get in on this study uh, will be able to come. I know some of them's not able to tonight. But uh, listen, go home and spend some time over there in the Old Testament where God tells Moses, this is what I want. You can't, you can't worship God any way you want to. You can't. God didn't, God didn't say now, I'll let you into the holy place if you can figure out some way to come through the wall. Uh, if, you get by, if you can get by this place out here, the brazen altar, if you can get by that, you can get back there. No. Matter of fact, God says you can't get any farther than right there until you have given yourself unto him as a sacrifice. I have folks tell me all the time, well, preacher, you, you know, you, you just, you're just 
you're just too old fashioned. You know, if you just change a few things, you get a lot more people. Church in, the church wasn't instituted to get people. I know that's a hard pill to swallow, but that's a fact. The church was not instituted to get people. The church was set up, was set up to let people know about the God of heaven. Now, he didn't just come anyway. He don't, he don't, mm, I don't have time. God has made a way. God has a plan. You can accept it. You can deny it. You can believe it. Or you can just say, I don't believe it. But the fact is, you'll not get to God without you go by his sacrifice. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Rep that altar right there, the first thing through the front door speaks of Christ. Every lamb slain, every bullet slain, every turtle dove slain, every sacrifice that's put on that altar speaks of Christ meeting the needs of those people. He'll meet your needs, but he won't meet your needs your way. He'll only meet your needs his way. Somebody said, well, I don't like that preacher. Well, take it up with him. All I am is a messenger. And uh, I really have a hard time. Uh, you know, we've got, what, 400 different denominations. And the truth is, there's only one way to heaven. Does that mean everybody's wrong? No, it means somebody's right. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the privilege we have to study your word together. I pray that uh, you might bless that which has been said, honor it with an understanding of how that you're portrayed, how that, uh, how that you're symbolized, how that uh, you have foreshadowed through the tabernacle of old your coming into the world and your dying on the cross, your resurrection and your opportunity for folks to come and be saved. Bless now, we'll be careful to thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining our worship service, and we appreciate you joining in. Each time that we come together to worship the Lord, we know that it's not possible for everyone to be here at the same time, so thank you for joining us today. If you're a child of God, you're a brother and sister of Christ, and we appreciate uh, the fellowship we have even uh, by the way of internet and if you've never trusted Christ this would be a great day to make your uh, salvation real and your life the Bible says if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shall believe in thine heart that God hath